such a delight uh, to be here. I am thankful to God for Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, for Trinity International University, and for the Henry Center and the work that is coming uh, from here. We need it uh, in the broader uh, world, so it's an honor to be here. Jerry Seinfeld, the comedian, pioneered a, a video series called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Uh, where he would take uh, some comedian peer and they would, uh, they would film getting into a car and just sitting down and talking about a variety of subjects. But one of the subjects that they would talk about is how comedy works. What are the dynamics of being able to get up and do something that if you think about it is actually terrifying to do stand-up comedy where you're not only public speaking, which most people are afraid of, but public speaking that demands an immediate response uh, from the people who are there. So you'll talk with people uh, such as Chris Rock or Kathleen Madigan or C's Sari or others, and one can imagine uh, many such conversations. One probably could not imagine a, an episode of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee with Reinhold Niebuhr. <laughs> But the theologian nonetheless worked uh, quite a bit with a, an influential essay uh, about humor, a theology of humor that was written utterly without any humor uh, whatsoever. <laughs> but it's insightful nonetheless because he says humor and faith are coming from the same place in one way. He says both are dealing with incongruence. So uh, the, the way that humor works is to come in and point out some paradox or contradiction or unexpected incongruence. And as long as it's not ultimately threatening to you, it's funny. When it starts to become, when the incongruence starts to become threatening to you, that's when it yields to faith or lack of faith. So Niebuhr said this, laughter is our reaction to immediate incongruities and those which do not affect us essentially. Faith is only possible, the only possible response to the ultimate incongruities of existence which threaten the very meaning of life. I thought about that this week after the death of comedian Norm MacDonald uh, who was uh, quoted in many uh, of his obituaries as talking shortly before he died about uh, the role of his craft to stand up comedians not to elicit applause but to elicit laughter. And he differentiated the two because he says applause is bringing in something that the audience has already thought through and they are applauding you to say, we agree with you. He says, laughter comes in with an element of surprise. The only way that it works legitimately is if there is a sense of surprise, sometimes uh, awkwardness, sometimes embarrassment, but genuine surprise, incongruity, that comes about there. What I would argue to you today is that this incongruity that we see is heightened when we really consider the essential aspects of our own humanity. And Niebuhr wrote about this. He said, when man surveys the world, he seems to be the very center of it, and his mind appears to be the unifying power which makes sense of the whole. But this same man, reduced to the limits of his animal existence, is preserving a precarious moment of existence within the vastness of space and time. So there is a profound incongruity between the inner and the outer world, or between the world as viewed from man's perspective and the man in the world as viewed from the more ultimate perspective. The incongruity becomes even more profound when it is considered that it is the same man who assumes the ultimate perspective from which he finds himself so insignificant. Essentially, this is simply a way for Niebuhr to say what Psalm 8 is saying. I, I consider the heavens and the works of your hands. What is humanity that you have made us? 
little lower than the angels, all things under our feet. And the sort of incongruity that Hebrews 2 uh, finds citing Psalm 8 and says, we do not yet see all things under the feet of humanity. The incongruity that's present there leads to, in some ways, laughter, the absurdity of it all, in some ways to a kind of longing sadness. And that longing sadness is amplified in a rapidly changing technological age such as the one we inhabit right now. I uh, found myself a year or two ago spelling out words to my wife, and it wasn't because I was trying to keep uh, a child from hearing about a birthday present or uh, a, a Christmas present or something like that. It was because I was telling her about the struggle that Amazon was having with putting uh, advertisements on the Super Bowl because they had to uh, master the sort of technology that would enable them to say, Alexa, on air in the most watched event in the world without immediately activating every Amazon Echo in the world. And as I was telling her about that, I said they don't want to say A-L-E-X-A, I realize, you know, if any other time in my life had known that I would be spelling out words so as not to be overheard by a little disc uh, on the side of the room, uh, I would not have been able to uh, fathom it. Or, as my uh, wife uh, points out and makes endless uh, fun of, uh, when I say thank you to Siri, that's the Mississippian, I have to, I have to do it. But the, the, the technological age that we're having right now, along with the naturalistic claims that seek to explain humanity, leads to a profound sense of insignificance and incongruity. So the Christian concept of creation is contested for many reasons in our culture. But part of that has to do with a sense of incredulity at the idea of humanity, of human beings, as being something more than the explainable and the material, as being essentially a mystery. Novelist uh, John Updike wrote uh, at the end of the 20th century about a character named uh, Rabbit, nicknamed Rabbit uh, Angstrom, following him through his life, and the moment where this character is about to have a heart surgery, and he's really, he's really thrown by the idea of someone putting a pig valve uh, in his heart. And he's also really upset about the idea of being hooked up to a machine with blood running through him. And another character in the story says to him, it's a piece of cake. You're knocked out cold, and what's wrong with running your blood through a machine? What else do you think you are, champ? And Rabbit responds, I think I'm a God-made, one-of-a-kind, with an immortal soul breathed in, a vehicle of grace, a battlefield of good and evil, an apprentice angel, all those things they tried to teach you in Sunday school or really didn't try very hard to teach you, just let them drift in and out of the pamphlets back there in that church basement, buried deeper in his mind than an air raid shelter. And Charlie responds, you're just a soft machine. Uh, that really is the question of the era. Are human beings soft machines? Are human beings uh, an algorithm? Wendell Berry uh, foresaw this, uh, several years ago, in responding to E.O. Wilson and to the, the challenge of materialism and, and naturalism and a kind of evolutionary psychology that sought to explain everything. And he says, the primary problem of the age is a metaphor. And he says, the metaphor is of the human being as a machine. 
He says, we think of our metaphors as not being very meaningful, but they actually tell us a great deal about the way we think, and they actually reinforce uh, a great deal about the way we think. And so the, the sort of language that we would use, someone who is really productive, we might say, he is a machine. Or someone that we can't figure out, we might say, I don't know what makes her tick. We have this metaphorical understanding of a machine so that Barry says we are conditioned by the assumption that our fleshly bodies are machines full of mechanisms fully compatible with the mechanisms of medicine, industry, and commerce, and that our minds are computers fully compatible with electronic technology. So added to this already existing question of whether uh, humanity is more than the, the, the animal order, uh, than the beasts, as the scripture would put it, there is the question of whether humanity is a machine or a god. This is anticipated by the book of Genesis, of course. Uh, the, in Genesis chapter 3, the, the serpent simultaneously appeals to the woman as something less than humanity. A beast of the field speaks to her and seeks to direct her, and as something more than humanity. Take of it, you will not die, you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So Updike's dialogue about humanity as a machine uh, echoing Sunday school and the counter vision of Christianity leads to a different vision and different form of humanity that is constantly contested. And I find even that little uh, dialogue back and forth that I mentioned some moments ago interesting because the, the Sunday school theology is being expressed by a character who is so driven by his appetites for sex and even for corn chips that he's given the name rabbit. And he's worried and talking about reliance on a machine and the distinction of himself from technology with all of that being explained to us by an omniscient narrator completely separate from the characters talking end of the Cold War and the advance of technology did not resolve the conflict that human beings have experienced of what does it mean to be human. Instead, in many ways, it has heightened it. So as, as Walker Percy warned us a generation ago, he says, the modern predicament is this ripping apart and this sort of a lack of integrity. He called it a monstrous bifurcation of humanity into angelic and bestial components against which the old theologies must be weighed before new theologies are erected. And Percy said the need for modern humanity is to recover the view of oneself not as an angel or a spirit, not as an organism in an environment, not as a machine, but as a wayfaring creature that is distinct from all of those things. So he used, the, uh, he used the language of humanity as being like a castaway on an island. A castaway on the island doesn't need information, although he may receive information about the, the goings-on on the island. What he needs is a bottle from beyond, he may know that he is, he is missing something, but if he doesn't know that he's stranded on an island, he can't really know that he's homesick. He can't really know what this longing is. But when he starts to see himself as a stranger, as a castaway, and despite the fact that he's tried his whole life to be at home on the island... He's as homeless now, Percy said, as he was the day he was cast up on the beach. And that, Percy said, is the paradox of Christianity. A P 
people who are at home in the world, created from the dust of the earth, and a people who experience a profound sense of homesickness, a, a people who have longings they don't know how to answer because they don't know how to see themselves as castaways. So Percy said, it's not information the castaway needs, it's news. News is coming from beyond. News is giving an outside perspective of his predicament. That has profoundly personal and social implications. Just in the few minutes before walking up to this lectern, I had probably five conversations that were built something around something like this. How difficult the last five or six years have been. How difficult the last two years have been for a variety of different reasons. But it seems to many people that the entire world is going through a nervous breakdown, which is why everyone is exhausted. And why I'll find myself having conversations with pastors who are exhausted and ready to quit and assume it's because they've done something wrong and then in the next minute talk to elected officials who are exhausted and ready to quit and assume it's because they've done something wrong, and then the next minute to people working in the service industry who are exhausted and thinking that they've done something wrong, but there's something that is different. So in speaking to a re respected uh, psychologist and, and social psychologist who's worked a lot on the history of um, of, of these sorts of questions, I said, you know, I have seen people who become increasingly curmudgeonly for one reason or the other uh, throughout their lives. So Carl Henry, uh, for instance, starts with this very sunny vision of an evangelical future, and his last couple of books are The Twilight of Western Civilization and Has Democracy Had Its Day? And so my question to him was, is this just what life is? And uh, we're just sort of surprised when we go through what every previous generation has gone through, or is something different? And his response to me was, something is different. There is an aspect of just human life but something has happened, and his theory is that this is traced back to about 2011 when Twitter put the retweet function into social media and around the same time that Facebook added a like feature. He said this contributed to a kind of hive mind that enabled the sort of political tribalism, cultural tribalism, uh, anger, and expressed anger that leads us to this sort of exhaustion in a kind of culture that is constantly judgment without mercy in every arena of life. At the same time, that we simultaneously think of ourselves as technologically advanced and able to solve uh, every problem technologically, and yet seeing constantly that that is not true. We're held captive by a microscopic virus. There are people living through natural disasters uh, all over the world right now. We know that we are vulnerable. And even on those questions, we know that we are vulnerable and that there is some distinct responsibility. No one is speaking to other primates about the responsibilities for climate change. No one is expecting a, a vaccine technology from any other aspect of biological life except for human beings. Appeals are being made to us internally and externally precisely because we know that it is a mystery to be a human being. What I would argue to you is that a Christian vision is one that can provide an alternative account. That 
sense of mystery and wonder that does not need to answer all the questions because it itself is posing the fact that we cannot know all of the answers right now. This mysteriousness of human nature points beyond itself to this greater mystery of the cosmos and explains both the human similarity to the rest of nature and the dependence of humanity on the rest of nature and the human predicament of alienation, of, of longing. When I was a youth pastor, there was an evangelist who came into town and had a, a night for teenagers. Uh, he was raffling off sneakers or something and, uh, and, and brought in this huge crowd of teenagers. And he stood up to give his gospel presentation and he said, there may be some of you in this room who just feel like things aren't right. And you see heads nodding. Some of you just feel like no one really understands the predicament that you're in and there's something wrong and you don't know what it is. It's probably because you were baptized in the wrong order and what you need to do is to come down the aisle and be baptized in order to nail that down. And I restrained myself from saying audibly, the problem is not their baptism, the problem is that they're teenagers. <laughs> there is no adolescent in the history of the world who has not felt alienated and misunderstood. Uh, that's the entire point. And that actually isn't outgrown as we come out of adolescence. It actually intensifies in some ways as we approach death. A Christian view of the mystery of human being as creature is able to account for these things that seem to be split uh, in our world right now and, and even in the church right now. Imagination and reason. Individualism and community. Realism and justice. Comedy and tragedy. These things that, that often are pitted against each other. Christianity comes in and, and, and claims both of them in every case because of a manger, a cross, an empty tomb. The reason that humanity is different and why humanity cannot evolve itself or invent itself out of our deepest and sometimes most unspoken fears. And these tensions cannot be replaced by an algorithm. An android can be at home in one sense, but an android cannot be a castaway. And we are. So just as in the first century, the strangeness of Christianity is our greatest strength. The perceived freakishness of Christianity is exactly what we have to offer the world. Flannery O'Connor argued uh, at near the end of her life about the critique that her, her fiction was just uh, not realistic enough. People said there are too many freaks in it. And she said, yeah, I'm intentionally going away from what you would call realistic because I find that the only way to consider human nature is to step away from expectation and to seek something. And she says, you know, when you, when you look at humanity, you see somebody who feels like that they should be in control of the world around them, and yet they're not. And so having a vision of all of that that sees the strangeness actually is realistic. And she said, a technological and reductionistically scientific view of a human being, much less a reductionistically spiritual view of the human being, doesn't push at the outer limits of that mystery. And so people then are dealing in uh, probability rather than possibility and mystery. And she says, that's why my characters are so freakish 
and why so much Southern literature is filled with freaks. She says, because we're still able to recognize one. She says, to be able to recognize a freak, you have to have some conception of the whole man. And the general conception in the South of that time is still in the main theological. It's dangerous to make that uh, statement because anything you say about Southern belief can be denied in the next breath with equal propriety. But approaching the standpoint from the subject of the writer, I think it is safe to say that while the South is hardly Christ-centered, it is most certainly Christ-haunted. The Southerner who isn't convinced of it is very much afraid that he may have been formed in the image and likeness of God. Ghosts can be fierce and instructive. They cast strange shadows, particularly in our literature. And in any case, it's when the freak can be sensed as a figure for our essential displacement that he attains true depth. It pictures incongruity that is the realistic picture of humanity. Now there are good and bad forms of incongruity. Uh, Eugene Peterson uh, wrote about the fundamental lack of congruence between the inner and the outer. One of the reasons why we see such a, a crisis of integrity in almost every institution in global life, certainly in North American life, certainly within the church, because things are not holding together. There is uh, a, a difference in terms of what someone actually says and does and what someone says he is doing and saying. That's a, a lack of congruence. But the fundamental incongruence is one that is deeply Christian and makes sense of everything else. A writer in Commonweal recently uh, argued that the, the fundamental sin of our time right now is not lust, it's not wrath. The fundamental sin is the old uh, monkish concept of acedia and says this is answered by the incarnation because acedia, which sometimes is thought of as sloth, but actually isn't uh, laying around in laziness. It's a sense of numbness, a, a sense of lifelessness. And this writer says the incarnation itself answers that because it's a malady that pulls apart the animal and the rational parts of our nature and pits them against each other. As the archetype of humanity, the incarnate Christ fully God and fully man, not only perfectly joins body and mind and thus heals our deformed schizophrenic human nature, but also bears in himself the fullness of God's sacramental presence in creation. Mystery and intelligibility, reliant upon one another. That's exactly the sense of wonder that's being evoked in Psalm 8. That's exactly the sort of logic uh, th that is given at the end of Job that does not neatly resolve all of the questions but puts Job not as a, a judge over what is happening but as a creature standing before a God. And that's exactly the way that we receive information and more to the point, the way we receive news. Jesus speaks to us in both reason and imagination, both to the individual and to the community, both with a realistic view of the world uh, around and human nature and a sense of objective justice and righteousness, both a sense of comprehension to the woman at the well you have had five husbands, I know who you are. And her response is a sense of wonder, this, this, who can this man be? That he tells me everything that is true about myself. Uh, th this comes right on the heel of Jesus saying to Nathaniel, 
here comes an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And when Nathanael says, you don't even know me, Jesus' response is to say, I saw you under the tree. And wh where does that take Nathanael? To a sense of wonder, how can you have seen me? To which Jesus says, that's nothing. We have greater wonders and greater mysteries yet to come. But speaking to this person personally, the sort of numbness and lifelessness all around us, outside the church and inside the church, leads to substitutes for life that often come about through anger. Why is it that people are consumed with outrage no matter where they fit on the political or cultural uh, spectrum. It's largely, I think, because that kind of unhealthy craving for controversy that Paul identified gives a semblance of life. There is a sense of adrenaline flowing in the outrage that makes a person feel like he or she is actually alive. And there is something in the dire warnings of immediate doom and catastrophe if this set of enemies is not destroyed that gives people a, a pretend sense of meaning and purpose in life so they are able to reenact all of the great confrontations and battles in history, able to see themselves as being at the decisive moment in the middle of the war, no matter what the issue, no matter what the uh, place, uh, no matter how this is being conducted, because one needs more and more and more outrage and anger in order to get that feeling of being stirred. Now, the, the problem with this is that, as C.S. Lewis said, there are signposts that God has set. There are longings that indicate to us that there's a, fill, a filling of those longings. There's, a, there's an end goal to those longings. And this sort of homesickness is one of those longings. If you don't see that, and if you don't see the creaturely gap there, then you're going to come up with the wrong answer. And what does the wrong answer ultimately look like for humanity? It looks like the vision that John has of a beast that comes out of the sea that claims for itself all of the prerogatives of God. A humanity that thinks of itself as more than humanity ultimately acts driven by appetites as one who is less than humanity. Be careful, Paul says, as you snap at each other that you do not devour each other. Animalistic uh, language there. But a Christian vision of a wayfaring humanity is able then to speak to a kind of authority without authoritarianism, a kind of community without collectivism, a kind of individual integrity without individualism, a kind of identity without fatalism and is able to hold those things together not in an ideology but in what Paul identifies in Romans 8 as the echo of a baby's cry. Something is wrong. The groaning that comes too deep for words. And the answer, when that Abba cry that's echoing Jesus in Gethsemane, crucifixion, indicating that something is wrong. A Christian vision of humanity has the answer, you must be born again. And he gives that to us in his own presence, in the preaching of his word, in the singing of the body together, in the tearing of bread, and the clinking of the cups. This is increasingly strange in an antiseptic technological age and increasingly strange 
in an increasingly animalistic and hostile age. It's something all together. In an age of machines and beasts, we have connectedness. Connectedness is killing us. Jesus replaces connectedness with communion. In an era of machines, we have effectiveness. But he gives us mission. And in a, a time like this, we have information. He gives us news. He gives us a word. And that gospel is able to speak both to our frailty and to our dignity and give it all to us in something that seems so distant right now, a human voice. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Moore, for a stimulating lecture. I appreciate it uh, very much. Uh, there you are. Thank, thank you. you. Um, and we've got uh, some microphones. We've got a question over here. Let me begin. Hang on just a moment. Let me begin this way. Uh, begin with a sort of a practical application question. So we've got the social, social media. We've got the uh, uh, informational technology, et cetera. So let's look at how that uh, two different bookends of life. The mm -hmm. older, and I'm thinking of church folk, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the younger. Mm -hmm. And on, on the one hand, this longing alienation, it's really almost led them to long for something backwards, not forwards. Yes. On the other hand, the younger generation, this, this life, the connectedness you talked about uh, that happens there, it's, it's almost led them to a dystopia. Mm -hmm. Is there any hope at all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what counsel do you give to those that are providing leadership to the spectrum of that in, in local churches? Yeah, uh, well, I, I think we've come from a largely utopian time into a largely dystopian time. And I would, I would argue it actually exists in both uh, ends of, of the spectrum. So rather than younger generations uh, thinking as, as younger people in previous generations would have thought, we're on the upswing of history and the, and, and the, the, the great uh, the great resolution of everything is out ahead of us, the future. Uh, now, every opinion survey would show you that uh, Generation Z believes that the future will be far worse for them than their parents and far worse uh, than things are right now. And so it's almost the exact same experience with the, the difference being that older generations tend to see a golden age in the past yeah and resent as though it's being taken away from them. But there is some of that happening also in the younger generation. Either something that previously was there and is gone, or something that never was there and should have been. Yeah. But I think it leads to the same, yeah. the same sort of place. Yeah. And ultimately, I mean, we, we swing back and forth. Yeah. Uh, we will get to, probably, a general kind of utopianism the way we do with uh, technology, very narrowly, but in other areas of life. But that leads to dystopia, because when the expectations, it's, it's, it's kind of like um, whenever I'm doing premarital counseling with people, one of the things I have them do is to write an, a little essay for a little paragraph for me that they don't talk to each other about that says, if I were to have an affair, I think this is probably the way that I would go about doing it, and here are the sorts of clues mm. that my spouse should look for. And it's inevitably it causes mayhem with the couple. <laughs> but yeah, I would yes, never cheat right, on her. Right, right. I would never cheat on her. We love each other. That's the point of the exercise, yeah. is to say, if you think uh, that, that somehow you are invulnerable to this, then you are the very people who are the most likely yeah. to be rent apart by uh, infidelity. And that's especially true when if you spend time with people whose marriages are coming apart because of adulterous affairs, in my experience, almost none of them are about sexual mm -hmm. uh, sensation, uh, sometimes the cheated on spouse, always almost, the cheated on spouse thinks I must not be attractive enough, 
uh, something. That's never what's going on. It almost always is someone who is feeling the kind of alienation that is heightened by responsibility mm -hmm. and wants to relive a time in his or her life when there was the drama of I like him, does he like me, does she notice me? And you can feel as though you're in high school or college again. If you have this ultimately high expectation of anything, it's going to lead not just to disappointment, but to resentment yeah. uh, there. So I think they both go in the same yeah. direction. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Yes, over here, please. Yeah, um, I'm a pastor in Milwaukee and I have a question about applying this theology into the local church context. Mm -hmm. Really two parts. How do we help people become aware of these deformative influences, um, particularly as we're kind of like fish in water a lot of times? I find that that's the difficult first yep. stage is even help, helping people be aware that they're being influenced mm -hmm. by these things. And then you kind of gestured to this a little bit at the end with the church's weird practices. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we then have counterformative practices to form us in the right direction? Yep. Um, on the first part of it, I would say usually you're not going to be able to come at it directly. You're going to have to, as Lewis would say, go around the watchful dragons and find ways to create in people at least a sense of longing for something else and then lead them toward in a, a, the patient, ordinary means of grace way to get there. But first you have to convince them that something's, something's not there. And uh, it's impossible to do that in the heat of argument. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll have pastors who will call me and say, I'm going to quit because I'm looking at Facebook and seeing what my people are posting and I'm just concluding, what have I been doing for the last decade? Because this is the end result. Well, uh, that, that really is not uh, the case. It's, it's just giving him an insight into what's happening uh, there and also giving him an insight as to, to find those ways to, as Nathan did with David, find the places where they already see that human life should be more than this and then offer a, a Christian way. And th there aren't new ways to do that. Th there are the ways of the preaching of the word, the, the singing of the community together, uh, the, the communion table, and then the sending out as a distinct people. That takes a lifetime. And one of the missing pieces, in my view, is a sense of liturgy. And that may sound uh, strange coming from somebody who for most of my life was a, a Southern Baptist, but I would argue that the rhythms of liturgy uh, aren't only belonging to the traditions that might be characterized as higher church, but have been exhibited in traditions that are known as lower church. They're just differently done. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that um, I think has caused a great deal of um, downgrade in some ways, not in a doctrinal sense, but just in life together sense, is in my tradition, the getting rid of the altar call. Good reasons for people to do that, to say that there's no command to walk down an aisle. Often this is manipulative. Uh, often this, uh, this gives a false view of what it means to, to follow Christ. It's very new innovation in the history of the church. But what it did when it was done right is to give a regular pattern for the people of God week by week by week at which they are going to be reminded who I am, just as I am, without one plea. They're being reminded of the fact that they are uh, in Christ by grace and reminded of the fact that they exist in the world as being on mission, uh, even if there is no physical response. So in whatever tradition uh, that, that a church is located, finding the rhythms of regularity rather than novelty is, I think, the way to ground people in a sense of humanity that's different. 
thank you. We've got a question uh, that someone has asked online. Uh, in thinking about deriving false life from anger, mm -hmm. how do we parse out the anger that is sparked by outrage and the righteous anger from injustice and pain? Yeah. Well, that's a, a similar question that could be said, how do I differentiate love from lust? Mm -hmm. Very different things, but they often seem mm -hmm. uh, to be the same. And it's often very difficult to differentiate when you're in, uh, in the middle of either love or lust to differentiate what the other is. Um, I would say if you, if you look at the biblical pattern, look at the life of Jesus. You have someone who is angry at a couple of points in the Gospels. One of those points is completely inexplicable to most people who would have been around at the time, the cursing of the fig tree. Uh, and, and the other, uh, in the temple, uh, there is a sense of anger and zeal for the holiness of God and the horizontal sense of justice with humanity. Those things are exceptional precisely because they are so rare. Usually, in the life of Jesus, there is a kind of tranquility that is itself disturbing. Why are you sleeping when, when we're in peril of being, uh, of being ripped apart on this boat? And Jesus says things that I know if I were there, I would say, you know, why are you afraid? Well, why am I afraid? I mean, don't you see what's going on? Uh, that, that's a natural response. You have the servants, uh, the, come, the armed servants coming to arrest you, and Simon Peter responds with the sword, and Jesus just goes forward with a kind of tranquility that can stand, stand before Pilate and say, you don't have any authority over me other than what has been given to you. That sort of tranquility is the normal pattern of the Christian life. And the sort of anger uh, in an in a integrated Christian personality is translated in a specific way. And that way is not theatrical outrage. Yeah. Uh, that way is through a sense of God's justice that demands a... a working on the problem and uh, justice for the vulnerable, but not a sense of ongoing outrage in general. Yeah. And so the, that, that, that sort of confusion of um, anger and outrage with conviction is one of the problems. Yeah. So it, it is very difficult to see when you're in the middle of yeah. it. What, what I would say to uh, people is, most people have a sort of um, expressed anger in a righteous, just sort of way, in a focused way, one or two, three times in their lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're constantly yeah. in that situation, then you should ask, is this the situation that I am around so much unfixable injustice that the anger is being evoked? Or am I finding ways to express a pre-existing condition of outrage and anger? And those are very, very different yeah. things. Yeah. If I could ask a question of, so, so, you know, the now and the not yet of the kingdom mm -hmm. in living this out, uh, it seems that there are, uh, the, the tension, of course, is on the one hand, you want to do all you can to bring it in. Right. And on the other hand, since the, 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 the nowness, on the other hand, it's, this, it's the not yet, so who cares? Mm -hmm. Who even cares? Yeah. And, and it's the, the, the inability to, to live with that tension, trusting the Lord, um, doing what you can, uh, like a William Wilberforce or, yeah. or someone like that. Yeah, and it's the, t it's the tension. It is. Because um, I'm, I'm convinced that C.S. Lewis was right when he said, echoing Aristotle, to say that the devil doesn't send evils into the world one by one, but two by two mm -hmm. on either side yeah. of uh, God's purpose. And so if you only see the one way that you can fall, clear. then you're going to fall. You have to see uh, how uh, you could um, 
you could either retreat over here into cowardness, a uh, cowardice, over here into what Paul calls quarrelsomeness, mm -hmm. pugilism. Yeah. And these aren't the answers to each other. They're both alternatives to courage. And so uh, that often means that you have to have people who not only know the tension in the created order and the tension in themselves, but also know themselves to the degree that they know where their particular point of vulnerability is. So I, mean, I, I have, um, I'll often have people who will say, I think maybe God's calling me into politics. How do I know if I am? And I think they're expecting me to either say, oh, we need Christians in the public arena, you absolutely should, or to say it's uh, an awful, unethical yeah. business, don't do it. But instead I say, are you somebody who has wanted to be in political office since you were a child? Yes. Uh, were you the guy that was always the student council president yeah. or the girl that was always at um, at the um, uh, mock state legislature, yes, then you probably shouldn't be in politics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Expecting the we, opposite. We, what, we, what we need are people uh, who, precisely because they do not delight in that particular kind of warfare by other means, yeah. are able to take the stakes down enough where it can actually be done effectively, rather than the people for whom this is uh, existential, either in terms of the meaning of my life uh, or in terms of, those are the people who should not be yeah. in that situation. Yeah. I mean, there's um, a church I was at one time had this unbelievable ministry to the um, strip clubs mm -hmm. in the community. A lot of women being trafficked in there. They tried to do an evangelism ministry and the women who went from the church uh, there was great hostility. Mm -hmm. The women said, you think you're better than us. You're, you know, you're self-right, you're judging us. They couldn't do anything. They sent another group of women a little bit older and it was even worse because the women in the, in the strip club, most of them in that place had bad relationships with their mothers yeah. and they sort of projected that here. Then they sent women the ages of their grandmothers. And that is how mm. they were able to see uh, women in these strip clubs come to Christ and wow. then be discipled, get, get, getting out of trafficking. Uh, well, how is that able to happen? If you say, let's have the senior high boys do the strip club ministry. Probably not. Probably a lot of volunteers, <laughs> probably not a lot of effectiveness. And if you went into the senior adult women's uh, Sunday school class or small group, uh, you're not gonna find anybody who longs to be in a strip club. But you do find a lot of people who, who long to share Christ yeah. with it. They're the ones who should be there. Yeah. And I think that often is the way that we sort of read our vulnerabilities and say they're gonna be some aspects of uh, the time between the times that are perfectly acceptable and someone is perfectly equipped to do it and I'm not. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. Uh, yes, please. Hi, uh, Bill Bash, Educational Studies. Dr. Moore, thank you so much. Uh, my questions, uh, I'd just like to hear you elaborate a little bit more on resources for engaging these issues and two kind of areas come to mind. Uh, the Trinity was engaged as a doctrine, it seems partly in response to the individualism it feels like you're saying the incarnation is especially apt for this time to really reflect on. The other resource kind of question is, you quoted a number of literary people from the humanities. I didn't do an exact count, but probably more than theologians. Mm -hmm. And I'm intrigued with that in, uh, in terms of resources that we should be aware of and embracing. Yeah, well, I'll take the second part first. Uh, th that's intentional because I think especially when we're dealing with anthropology, uh, fiction gets at some of those mm -hmm. questions much better than abstract thought does. Uh, Eudora Welty, uh, the novelist, um, uh, she, was, she wrote a, a little essay called Should the, uh, Should the Novelist Crusade? And she said, a plot is more unsettling than an argument. 
uh, because a plot is experienced. And Frederick Buechner said something similar when he was talking about the tendency of people to um, preach the parables of Jesus as though what you're trying to do, he used the image of an orange, you're wringing the orange out uh, and, and taking the juice. When that's not why Jesus told parables. He's, he's telling parables because there is something different about experiencing uh, in this way being on the road to Jericho than an abstract lesson in uh, love of neighbor. And so I think often, sometimes not even in terms of the, uh, not in terms of the answers, but often in terms of the questions, you're going to find it there because the the guard is down. You're, you're dealing with uh, especially insightful uh, views often into human nature because that's what's being studied. And the guards are down because it's not a debate. Mm -hmm. So people are often able to tell you uh, what it is that they're, that they're missing and what they're longing for in ways that they're not mm -hmm. in terms of a, a debate. And so I, I find that, you know, as teaching preaching, um, I would constantly say uh, to people, you need to be uh, reading fiction because you would have, uh, I would find a lot of students who wouldn't know how to preach most of the Bible because they only knew how to, to preach a Pauline epistle and they would translate everything else into a Pauline epistle and then be able to, to preach it then. But uh, if all scripture is God-breathed and profitable, that means that you're not just speaking to um, the cerebral cortex, not that the epistles do that either. Epistles are built upon a, a narrative, but you're speaking to the full human being and what it means to be human. And as for the incarnation, yes, I think that, I think that incarnation uh, which in this sense includes uh, also crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, is uh, probably the central doctrine that upsets the ways that we tend to see the world and ultimately answers that joining of heaven and earth, God and humanity, all of those things in the person of Jesus Christ. And I think that's, uh, I think that is often where, where people, even if they don't yet know it, are finding something missing. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, the transhumanist, uh, you talk about utopian, mm -hmm. um, well, or dystopian, who, who says that humanity ultimately is gonna be fully integrated into machines and you'll be able to upload your consciousness uh, and uh, humanity will then evolve through artificial intelligence to an entirely different sort form of consciousness mm -hmm. that will be able to transcend death. Uh, because the, the, if once you figure out how the neurons work and, and you're able to replicate that and transfer files, then there is no death. There was a documentary done about him where at the very end of this, the interviewer said, do you believe, in, uh, do you believe that there's a God? And he said, not yet. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the fundamental problem uh, of humanity all the way back to the very beginning. Uh, the person of Jesus Christ resolves that. Yeah. Uh, one other, any resources? Um, with, with resources, I think you're going to, um, you're going to, you're not going to have one set of resources because the problem it manifests itself right now in so many different ways that there, one set of resources would have the exact opposite effect on someone. So I think a lot of that has to do with simply paying attention to how in this particular context are these things manifesting themselves. And again, as we mentioned earlier, a sense of patience. Mm -hmm. there, there, there just is no way to undo all of this uh, in a short period of time. This requires that slow, often invisible of work over a long period of time. Yeah. 
Thank you. Here's another question. Hang on. We got over here first, I think. Um, but here's another uh, question from uh, Dwight Gibson. Um, you mentioned the first century church, mm -hmm. a time of despair and of opportunity. What are our opportunities in the current nervous breakdown? There are phenomenal opportunities. One of those being that a, a nervous breakdown cannot go on uh, infinitely. Uh, ner nervous breakdowns are by definition exhausting. Mm -hmm. And so there is a sense of exhaustion of, uh, of people who are saying, uh, I, would, I was sort of um, laughing to myself um, over the last year, year and a half, at how many people would, uh, would say something along the lines of this. Ugh, we can just get through the election. Then everything will settle down. <laughs> When the election happens, well, we can just get to that electoral college vote, everything will settle down. We can just get to pass the inauguration, then everything will settle down. If we can just get to uh, the, the flattening of the curve in the pandemic, if we can just get to the unrolling of the vaccine, if we can just get to, and at every point, uh, there is not any lowering of all of the tensions, yeah. there's just a transferring of all yeah. that of that to yeah. something else. And so the people who were uh, screaming at each other about the election then were screaming at each other uh, over uh, critical race theory and then screaming at each other over masks and then screaming at each other over uh, conspiracy theories and that, I mean, all of those things. There comes a point of exhaustion with that and also, uh, the, the flip side of secularization that makes me very hopeful is that it moves people out of the sense of uh, what Kierkegaard was complaining about uh, in his church, in the, the Danish church, this sense of everybody's by default a Christian. Yeah. Um, there, there is a moment where Christianity comes with a kind of uh, a sense of alarm and wonder that actually gets it. Now, I've noticed the shift being on college campuses, the shift with uh, atheists. Atheists will always come, atheists will always ask questions. 10 years ago, they usually were kind of in the Christopher Hitchens, mm -hmm. Richard Dawkins mode. They wanted to argue and sometimes were very angry. Now, if I encounter an angry atheist, it's almost always somebody who is just coming out of the church and mm -hmm. wants to find somebody to stand in for Aunt Flossie or yeah. Mom and Dad or the youth pastor or whoever that they're really wanting to really upset about. But mo more often, you're ending up with atheists who will say, I've never, you really think this dead body came back to life? You really think that? Uh, I mean, well, that's exactly the response yeah. you're having in the book of Acts. Yeah. And that, that strangeness can bring with it a great deal of power if we don't become the kind of people who are panicky or resentful mm -hmm. and actually see what, what God is doing in the world. I think mean, a great time of opportunity. Yeah. That's O'Connor's freakishness, a yeah. resurrection of a dead body. Yes, please. I'm, uh, so I'm, I don't feel dressed for the part. <laughs> I'm an undergraduate student here. I've come here with my math class. Um, I'm also a student leader. Your talk was very helpful, and I really appreciate all the topics you covered. It's been really encouraging to me to hear these things. One topic that stood out especially to me was at the end you discussed about our stance of all, kind of wanting to be in the right and how, how that can affect our view. And mm -hmm. as a uh, it's more my height than anything. I've, I've grown up and I've grown up and I've lived out that experience myself, where I've seen people, especially mothers, who see their kids around myself growing up and realizing, thinking this is some big old angry teenager who wants to threaten my child. And I've I've been that target, saying, we're, we're that desire to be in the right, and that desire to see find an enemy in the circumstance you're in, ends up coming out and sometimes sometimes in a negative in a negative way or in a discouraging way or in, in a in a way that isn't honoring to God, even whether or not it's in a Christian circle or outside of that. Mm -hmm. 
what, what should be our response to, I know you mentioned just in general, we know in life things will take time. It will take time for us to grow our communities, grow our, our world to be more Christ-centered, to be, to be a better world, a one where we still love to one another. But what are things we can do in the here and now to start moving towards that, to start addressing these issues where we see someone's desire to be, someone's desire, their, identi- their desire to establish their identity as not a machine, not a, not, not some com- conglomerate, but as an identity of saying, I want to be in the right, this is my identity. Mm-hmm. What are steps we can take to make sure that whether it's ourselves or people around us, don't do that at the detriment to others around us? Yeah. Well, it's a good question, and I think the answer to it is uh, confidence. I mean, what seems to be so confident um, as, as Paul says, uh, who are very confident of the assertions that they're making. Uh, what seems to be great confidence is almost always rooted in a, an insecurity and a terror at that insecurity. And so it's, it's kind of like there was a, a psychologist who was writing about um, why so many child stars regardless of whether they were in movies or the pageant circuit or whatever, tend to fall apart uh, later on. Not always, but but tend to. Mm -hmm. And he argued it's because of what the desire for fame actually is. And he argued that you can tell the health of a child that you are raising or discipling based upon whether or not that child wants to be famous. And the reason is because he said what fame is for most people is a way of seeking kindness in advance from strangers. So uh, I can, if I'm known by you and loved by you, then I don't have to be fearful of you when I encounter you. And then you end up with the worst of all possible worlds because you end up with the very people who are the least equipped to uh, withstand this and who don't understand the way that fame works, which is uh, is kindness in advance followed by resentment in advance, followed by uh, joy at seeing the downfall in advance. I mean, that's just the way that 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 works. Well, that's exactly that's coming from a place of insecurity. Mm And uh, often these rancorous, uh, outrage sorts of cultures, uh, not just often, I would say almost always, are coming from this fundamental fear, if I am not proven to be right, and if I do not defeat you right now, then it's, it's all over. You know, that's the reason now, before I was doing uh, public policy uh, work, and when I came into that role, I told all my closest friends, I said, if you ever hear me say the words, this is the most important election in our lifetimes, come take the keys, because I've been hearing that uh, every four years since I was able to, to understand what was being said, uh, and I know it was probably being said uh, going all the way back to Abraham Lincoln, when it was probably true, uh, but uh, but that sense of that sense of, of existential anxiety and a sense of having to put a judgment seat out here right now and have it resolved. That's a that's not a surplus of confidence. It's a deficit, and it's people who don't have an understanding of the judgment seat of Christ, if they're Christians. Because if you really have an understanding of final judgment, then what you're going to do is to say, I don't have to win this argument for this argument to be won. And I don't have to submit myself to all of these little judgment seats when I know that there's one that counts. So as Paul says, I consider it a small thing to be judged by you. Not because he's saying, you can't judge me. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, he's saying, because I am judged by Christ. So when you don't have that sense of, uh, of accountability that only makes sense in eternity, and if you don't have the sense 
that every person that you fear, maybe even legitimately, may well be your future brother or sister in Christ. Mm -hmm. Uh, then that, that is just an entirely different way of, of seeing reality. That's, that's where we need to be. The problem with that is that discipleship is very difficult right now. And one of the reasons discipleship is very difficult is simply in terms of the ratio of time within the worshiping, discipling community compared to the time where there are uh, a thousand different inputs uh, coming in, and they're not a thousand different inputs. It, it enables you to find a cocoon where you have a thousand inputs that you want to hear that can establish you in what you already want to uh, believe so that everything that seems different from that sounds like blasphemy to you. Not like a disagreement, but like blasphemy. And, and then the stakes just keep getting higher and higher and higher. So it's very difficult. And um, I think it's going to have to get a little bit worse before it yeah. gets better. But I do think there's a floor to it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please. Hi, Dr. Moore. My name is Jody Craiglow. I am also an EDS uh, doctoral student here. Um, I was in the audience the last time you gave a public address here at Trinity, and I've been following you since then, and I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you for the integrity and perseverance I have seen displayed by you over the past few years. Um, and my question deals with that actually. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> so you were talking about the tranquility in the face of those who have an appetite for controversy. And as someone who has had a lot of experience with that, um, could you give us some insight on how to do that, especially when the people whose appetites for controversy are coming from your own camp? Well, it, one is most vulnerable to the controversies that are coming from one's own camp. There, there really is no, uh, that's one of the reasons why you have so much conflict and controversy is because it's not only that there is no risk to you with controversy coming from the opposing camp, whatever that opposing camp is, but there's also great gain for you because what you're doing is actually speaking to your tribe over here. Uh, that's why you know, uh, there are uh, probably uh, 15,000 YouTube videos a minute uh, being uploaded with so-and-so owns so-and-so, you know, with some sort of thing like that. Um, so it's, it's, when it's in the own, uh, when it's in one's own tribe because there is something I think below the rational level for which the threat of exile feels like, even if it's not, feels like an existential threat. So um, I think that almost every person is going to have to decide a couple things. One of those things is going to be, um, do I conform to everything in whatever tribe or herd that I have because it's going to be easier and I simply become that. Can I do that in every case? And then secondly, to say when that doesn't happen, when is, there's a, there's a time where one says, I'm not giving up, I'm enduring, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm patiently uh, enduring and doing something. That, that has a great deal of um, virtue to it and often is exactly the right thing to do. What can happen though is that there comes a point where that turns into a kind of complicity mm -hmm. because you can find it in almost every, I mean, uh, the, Christianity Today has, uh, has this podcast series, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, and which is talking not just about that church, but about a lot of toxic mm -hmm. church cultures. 
in almost all of those situations, almost all of them, if you talk to people who have responsibility in there, you will find people who will say, this is crazy, <laughs> but who will say, but if I'm not here, there will be no grown up in the room and the wheels will come off. So I have to be here and then that becomes, well, let me choose my battles, and this isn't one of them, and then that ultimately becomes a, a sort of trauma bond with the toxic culture. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to tell where that line changes, but, but there is one. Um, and so I would say in terms of tranquility, there's a, there's a good kind and a bad kind. The bad kind is the sort of um, self-protective tranquility that is uh, simply trying to avoid vulnerability. So uh, one of the things that drives me crazy, but I've kind of gotten used to it, is when I'll be somewhere and someone will come up and say, I know everybody hates you, but I really like you. Uh, <laughs> Or, Thank you. I argue with my mom about you every day. I'm like, okay, I don't really need to know that. And it, it, it's easy to just sort of oh, shrug it off in order to, to say, I don't really want to uh, experience that. That's the kind of tranquility I think can lead to some, it leads to numbness, actually. The kind of tranquility I'm talking about is a Romans 8 groaning, mm -hmm. weeping, but a constant working through to say what's really important and who's really important. Mm -hmm. And um, but a friend of mine, uh, David Brooks, has a, a book um, on character where he talks about the difference between resume virtues and uh, eulogy virtues. Mm -hmm. And he says in the culture that we're in right now, we're pressured to uh, have all of the resume virtues. And that's, that's what we present ourselves with. But actually, at the end of life, none of those things matter. Yeah. What people are looking for are the eulogy virtues, which are not about so-and-so made partner at the youngest age in her law firm. It's about mm -hmm. this, was, uh, this was somebody who uh, was with me when uh, my dad had cancer. This is a, th those aspects of character. So starting to step back and say what's really important to me and who is really important mm -hmm. to me. Um, because when the tribe, and whatever tribe it is, turns, and there is a sense where you say, I do have to go to a different story, uh, you have to remind yourself that you're not leaving Jesus here. And, and that's the problem with a lot of what's happening with uh, the ex, various forms of ex-evangelical uh, deconstruction. Not all of them, because some of them are just saying, I don't want the word evangelical. But a lot of them are overreacting mm -hmm. or counterreacting to what they legitimately have seen as a problem but they're moving into a different problem, and that is totally understandable. Mm -hmm. I have seen the best and worst of Christianity, and I know that there are some things, if I had seen them when I was 25, I would probably be an atheist. Mm -hmm. there, has to, there has to be mm -hmm. enough time to know Jesus well to know that, uh, that, that this actually isn't Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a long process. Yeah, that's, a, yeah. that's a good word. Um, we'll give our executive director of the Henry Center the last question. Okay. Thank you uh, so much for being with us today, Dr. Moore. Um, you know, the, the tranquility and controversy question I think fits well with the creation project in general. Background of the whole project is to say, hey, there's, there's too much anim animosity right now uh, between the church and, and science. And uh, so on the one hand, trying to foster constructive reflection on the doctrine of creation, on the other, uh, nurture productive conversations between issues in the sciences and theology. Um, in your talk, science largely figured uh, with some of the more controversial um, 
side of science, people like Dawkins or Kurzweil, scientism, mechanistic reductions of human. But if you could give us some sort of exhortations, pastors, you know, we're gonna have doctors and nurses and engineers in their churches. I think there's some students in the class, uh, in the audience who are in those fields. Give us some exhortations on how we could maybe not lose the mystery of life in the church, maintain our faith in the, in the, the hope that we profess, but also foster more constructive um, reflection and engagement with the scientific community. Mm -hmm. um, not a question not inappropriate even in, as we think about issues like uh, the coronavirus and how we respond to it. Could you maybe give us some, some guidance on a more yeah. constructive way forward? Yeah, and, and when it comes to the actual scientific community, uh, the, the trend is actually toward something much closer to a Christian vision of reality, not the other way, because what's happening with scientific advances is, is not the accumulation of more and more knowledge toward an explaining of the universe, but an increasing reality of what is unexplainable. And uh, the fact that uh, you know, it, it's, it's no longer uh, seen as deficient for, for a physicist to say, I don't know how dark matter works. Uh, because that, that's, that's, that's the only way to understand the universe right now is to understand that you don't understand the universe right now uh, and to move forward. So I think that is, is moving in a good direction. The problem is, um, and it's, it's kind of funny because I had within 24 hours uh, a scientist and an artist say to me, the scientist said, it's really hard for me to go to church uh, and it's hard for my friends who are, he's a, he was a biologist, but he said it's hard for uh, fellow biologists and others to come to church because uh, the church is so suspicious of the mind. Uh, and, and is so kind of emotive, but not, um, but not, uh, but suspicious of the intellect. And so it's just hard for us. And then I had an artist who said, it's really hard for my fellow filmmakers and visual artists to, uh, to go to church because the church is so cerebral <laughs> and doesn't understand artists. Uh, I actually think both are telling the truth. Sometimes about the, the, same, the same reality. One of the things that has to uh, change, and I think is changing uh, when it comes to the relationship between Christianity and science, is um, there's a tendency, and you often saw it in evangelical interactions with science, and now I think you see it in almost every aspect of culture well, without, well outside of Christianity which is if I can find the easiest and most awful caricature of whatever it is that I'm arguing against, that is going to be the most convincing way to, to go. That is true in the very short term. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember being a four-year-old and hearing a pastor say, uh, and I don't know why he was addressing this, because it was long after this was even a thing, but addressing the death of God movement mm. uh, theology and saying, if God is dead, why wasn't I at the funeral? I'm his child, amen? And I remember thinking, I don't know what this is, but I don't think that's going to be a compelling <laughs> argument to it. And when there is this, uh, this uh, picturing of here is a confident Christian answer to all of the scientific questions that are there, and the people who would say otherwise are evil and stupid, and let me show you how. It's easy to do that until people actually then encounter both the science and the scientists, where they realize there really isn't a cabal of supervillains uh, out there seeking to uh, destroy us. Well, that's not what's happening here. Uh, and these people aren't stupid and they're not evil. The, the, the response is naturally, if they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to this, and they clearly don't, mm -hmm. then how do I trust them to know how to be resurrected from the dead? 
Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the ways that we move forward is with a great deal more I don't know. Mm, humility. Mm -hmm. the, the, the questions that the Bible doesn't uh, address doesn't mean that we don't have ideas about how those things work, but it does mean that we don't have uh, a thus saith the Lord mm -hmm. uh, sort of response to, to those things. And, um, and I think if you look at what's happening uh, in the scientific community, and it seems especially in the area of physics, uh, among younger scientists, there are a great deal uh, more Christians than one would assume. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to them and you say, uh, why, how did you become a Christian? Almost never is it going to be because uh, I uh, was in an argument and that person had a drop dead argument as to why uh, the Big Bang had to come from an intelligent designer. I've never encountered that. Uh, but I have encountered, the more I've been doing this, the more I, I'm mm -hmm. realizing I have a sense of awe. Yeah. Just like there's something that looks at this and says, this is wild. And I've had to say, where does that come from mm -hmm. and what does that mean? And I've found that uh, the gospel addresses that in a way that nothing else does. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's right. Yeah. And I, I think that, that should be our posture going forward. Yeah. Thank you. Let's again thank uh, Dr. Russell Moore. Thank you. Take that very much. As we uh, conclude today, let me just make a couple of reminders. Our next uh, Henry uh, Center event will be uh, September 30th. Um, Justin Barrett, uh, Evolutionary Theology, The Problem of Human Thriving with a Stone-Aged Mind. Um, and plus, uh, uh, we do want to hear from you, so uh, fill out our survey about the event today, and you can enter to win a $75 Amazon gift card. So make sure that you do that as well. As we close, would you please stand? We're going we're gonna, to... Uh, share a blessing, and it goes back to what Dr. Moore shared, that is the, the significance of the incarnation. This comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you this day.